Okay. Uh, if you have your outline there in front of you, and hopefully maybe some of you had a chance to try to complete it, the first thing that we want to talk about it, no, let's back up, is God's battle plan for inheriting the promised land. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20, because God gave specific instructions on how to take charge of the land inside and outside. So if you have your Bible open, first of all, stop off at verse 1 of Deuteronomy 20. And again, this is an important verse, and we will see, especially tonight, about the tribe's failures, how they disregarded this verse. Chapter 20 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. God says this, when you go out to battle against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you. And we're going to see that some of the tribes, uh, in particular Judah, had a hard time ridding the inhabitants of the land because they had chariots. Well, God forewarned them that this was a possibility. And what does he tell them? Don't be afraid of them. Why? Because the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt is with you. Now, let me encourage you and remind you that when you read Scripture, there are things here that are desperately important for you to observe. In Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, notice your observation powers here, okay? For uh, um, for the Lord God, the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, brought you up from the land of Egypt. At that particular point, these people should have had flashbacks. Gee, what did God do for us in bringing us out of Egypt and handling the first skirmish with the Amalekites, of feeding us manna, of feeding us quail? and different things like this, for 40 years protecting us. This is the same God who is going to bring us into the land. In fact, everything he did in preparation for us to inherit the land, all of the miracles down in Egypt and the other things that I've just recounted uh, for us, should have been reminders of the faithfulness of God to his promise that he told Moses, who communicated to the Israelites who were in captivity in Egypt, God has given you the land. Now let's go to how they are supposed to approach cities outside of the land. And there's three things I want to bring to your attention. Um, and... Uh, I guess I'll pick that up afterwards. Okay. First of all, outside the land. Take a look at in verse 10. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. Now, this is outside of the promised land. This is outside of the promised land. God is not saying that you can't expand, and obviously we will see this under Solomon. But he says, this is how I want you to approach these cities. First of all, offer it terms of peace. Otherwise, verse 11, if it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. All right, so there is going to be a siege that takes place if they accept the terms of peace and they will be uh, servants to Israel. But then it goes on to say in verse 12, however, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. So outside the land, they were to first of all 
offer terms of peace. And if the people accepted the terms of peace, then part of the encumbrance, if you please, is that they would be servants of that particular tribe that laid siege to the city. If they decided, no, we are not going to serve you, and they instigate the warfare, and that's what we should get out of here, then whatever tribe laid siege to that city would engage in warfare, and it would be a, a very costly um, battle that would take place. All the men were to be uh, put to death. Now, what about inside the land? Well, I want you to turn in your Bibles and look at Deuteronomy 20, verse 15, and we'll pick it up there. What's the procedure for inside the land? Verse 15, thus you shall do to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of, the, of these nations nearby. So that's a summary. That's a summary. So verse 16, only in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So that's the promised land. You shall not leave anything that breathes alive, but you shall utterly destroy them. The Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites as the Lord your God has commanded you. Well, my goodness, God, why are you being so vindictive here? Where is your love and compassion? I don't understand. Well, we'll look at verse 18 and note the reason. So that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they have done for their gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. What's God saying? I want to protect you from the evil, wicked influences of the land that you're going into. They are idol worshipers. They are involved in human sacrifices. I don't want you getting all wrapped up in this. And so you are to eliminate their lives. And it was for a cleansing process. That's what it says in verse 8. A cleansing, a protection. You know, when you get an in, uh, when you get it in, somebody's got their mic on and rattling in the kitchen there. When you have an infection, the doctor gives you an antibiotic for the purpose of cleansing your body from the infection so the wound can heal. Now, with these thoughts in mind, Let's take a look at the tribal chart and see how many of you were able to, to get this. I don't think it was real difficult for you if you just read the scriptures. Benjamin, uh, we read about, let me get over to Joshua. In, uh, we read about Benjamin, verse 21 of Judges chapter 1. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. So who was the adversary, Benjam uh, the uh, Jebusites? What was the result? They recaptured Jerusalem. What do you mean they recaptured Jerusalem? Well, if you go back to Judges chapter 1, verse 8, then the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem, captured it, and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. So somewhere between Judges 1.8 and Judges 1.21, the Jebusites rebuilt the city. They went back and they rebuilt the city. And Benjamin did not drive them out. Judah did, but evidently they didn't leave a vanguard behind. Then you have Joseph in verse 23. Likewise, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them, and the house of Joseph spied out Bethel. Now, the name of the city was formerly Lutz. The spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, 
please show us the entrance to the city and we will treat you kindly. Kind of sounds like Rahab, right? So he showed them the entrance to the city and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go free because they made a commitment to do so. Now watch this. The man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and named it Lutz, which is its name to this day. So what happened with Joseph? His adversary were the Hittites, and the results were the presence of the Hittites, because this man left and went into this area, and this Canaanite group of people uh, continued to dwell in the land. Now you've got Manasseh in verse 27. But Manasseh did not take possession of Bashan and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Ib, uh, Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. So the Canaanites persisted in living in the land. It came about when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor but they did not drive them out completely. So you got Manasseh and the adversary were the Canaanites and you have cohabitation. Exactly what God did not want them to do. Now you have Ephraim in verse 29. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who were living in Ger uh, Gerzer. So the Canaanites lived in Gerzer among them. Same thing, Canaanites and they lived among them. Now you have Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nehola. Uh, so the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Same thing. Same thing. And then you have Asher beginning in verse 31. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Echo or the inhabitants of Sidon or of uh, ah, ah, lab, or Exziba, or blah, 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 blah. I can't pronounce those names. I'm sorry. Verse 32, so the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. There you have it right there. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, and the inhabitants of Beth Shemus and Beth uh, Anya became forced labors for them. But they were supposed to drive them out. They were supposed to not uh, put them into forced labor. The only area that they were permitted to put them into forced labor was outside of the land. And then you have Dan. And they, then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the valley. Yet the Amorites persisted in living in Mount Heres, in uh, Ijalon, and in Shalbim. Uh, but when the power of the house of Joseph grew strong, they became forced labor. The border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akabim, uh, from Sila and upward. So how many how many tribes did not obey God's command? You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tribes. Levi is not uh, involved with this because he was not given an inheritance. He was to dwell among his brethren. And that's where you have the cities of refuge. So this is quite startling, isn't it? Especially when God said, don't be afraid if they got chariots. Don't be afraid if they got horses. Don't be afraid if they are more in number than you are. I am with you. I have given you the land. Excuses. Justified their disobedience to God. And this will produce multiple generational problems because they did not obey the Lord. Kind of like a domino effect. 
that takes place. Now, I want to answer a couple of questions here. Why is Simeon dwelling in Judah's territory? Not swelling, <laughs> dwelling in Judah's territory. And if you take a look at one of the maps that I gave you there, you'll see Simeon down in Judah's territory. Well, what most of the people uh, commenting on this question said that they were absorbed by Judah because they were small and insignificant. So Simeon was absorbed by Judah, and they dwelt within Judah's inheritance. They had their own little inheritance there, but it was a part of a larger section of land, if you please, for Judah. Now, where is Issachar? Don't have anything in here about Issachar. What happened to Issachar? Well, historians indicate that there in uh, that um, he was mixed in with Manasseh. So when you read about Manasseh's failure and allowing the Canaanites to dwell among them, because there's no other reference about Issachar until much later on, they believe that he became intertwined, if you please, with Manasseh. Uh, Issachar will have a very um, important epithet written about them. And I shared this with you several weeks ago that the, the uh, men of Issachar, uh, understood the times and what was going on and were able to advise the people. So even though there's not much said about them and they seem to be absorbed by Manasseh, they come and play a very important role later on in Old Testament history. All right, what about Gad and Reuben then? Well, Gad and Reuben, if you look at that map, they're on the other side of the Jordan. And they were given their land on the other, other side of the Jordan by Moses and then by Joshua, who distributed the land. But they are outside, if you please, the promised land. And that is how we account for their lack of information here in Judges. Now, let's talk about the lessons that we might be able to learn here, and then I want to show you the other three maps and uh, continue to try to explain some things and answer any questions that you might have. One of the lessons that I think that we need to understand is incomplete obedience is still complete obedience. Incomplete obedience is still complete obedience. In God's economy of holiness, there is not a degree of holiness. It's 100%. Because when his son died and provided salvation for you and me, it was 100% salvation. It wasn't a, a portion, and we had to work for the rest of it. When there is incomplete obedience, obedience to the word of God, we cannot expect the full blessing of God because we're not doing what he says. And there are a number of illustrations in the Bible. One I've referred to a couple of times. Let me just remind you about the battle of Jericho. The battle of Jericho and if you understand the archaeology of that city and its walls and so forth and so on, was a monumental victory. But Israel did not get the victory. Israel got the victory. Let me rephrase this. Israel got the victory because of their complete obedience. Now, I'm not talking about perfection here, beloved. I'm talking about obedience to what you know the word of God has to say. And God, the angel told jo uh, Joshua, here's how you take the battle, right? 
march around the city, so forth and so on. At any point, if they did not honor the instructions that the angel gave to Joshua and Joshua gave to the people, the walls would not have come down. The walls would not have come down. They were disobedient. One family was when Achan took something underneath the band. And then Joshua complicated the obedience or their disobedience when he listened to them and did not make all of the men 20 years and older go out to battle, which was God's law given back in Deuteronomy. Incomplete obedience is still disobedience. And then fin fear hinders the life of faith to obey God's will. I think in each one of these tribes, though it's not specifically stated, I think there is an element of fear in their lives. I can't identify it because it's not specifically identified in the scriptures. But when you and I become fearful, the life of faith becomes difficult for us. And it's hard for us to obey God's word and God's will. We begin to question it. Fear influences us to second guess God. Is that really what he is saying? Does he really expect me to do this? Am I really understanding things? You know, if we ever get through the book of Hebrews, <laughs> Hebrews has the definition of faith about seeing a uh, faith believes that which it doesn't see. We don't need to have evidence. Paul said in the book of Romans that if faith is able to see, to believe, then it's not faith. And so fear hinders the life of faith to obey God's will. And then incomplete obedience can produce a lifetime and generational consequences. Incomplete obedience can produce a lifetime, maybe change that word and to of generational consequences. What does that mean? Does that mean my children and grandchildren are uh, uh, predicted to go ahead and be disobedient in their life? Are they doomed because of a parent's failure to obey God? No, they have free will. They have a choice. However, the influence of parents living a life of incomplete obedience and escaping the consequences can influence that child to say or to think, aha, dad got away with it, so can I. Mom got away with it, so can I. You've heard me use this term before of, of um, preconditioning, preconditioning. That means a second generation has observed the first generation and has witnessed how they have sinned against God and have been able to live with the consequences or maybe even, according to the second generation, avoid the consequences and seek to duplicate it because of what they have witnessed. This is a very real problem many times in families. Um, immorality, if it's not repented of and not demonstrated to children, can promote immorality in the child's life. Drinking the same way, gambling the same way, whatever sin, whatever sin can be duplicated by the children if they have witnessed.
their parents flaunting their rebellion against God. Now, I'm going to stop showing this screen, and I'm going to uh, show you another one uh, here in a moment, but I want to see if there's any questions before I do that. Any thoughts, any, you know, Rick, I, I don't quite understand this. Okay, I'll show you the second screen then. Hopefully. No. Hang on, I'm going to get it here. There it is. All right. Oh, come on. Uh, that's. Hang on, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay, let's do it this way. Okay. Now, I want to I want to show you something that I hope will explain some things when we talk about the Canaanites. Okay? From Noah, you had 3 sons and from there, three nations, if you please, spawned off. And many historians believe that the Canaanites came from Jephthah. And all of their genealogy and tracing back, so forth and so on, they trace it back to Jephthah. If you take a look at the same principle, you have Abraham, God gave him Isaac, God blessed Isaac with twins, Jacob and Esau, and the 12 tribes came from Jacob, which were the 12 nations of Israel. I'm just trying to establish what this might look like now, if my assumptions are true. The Canaanites, if you please, are the um, paternal clan, uh, the godfather. I hate to use that term. And so when you take a look at the Hittites and the Perizzites and all these other ites here, they are clans related family to the Canaanites. Now, sometimes it is expressed which particular ite that the tribe of Israel is warring against. And when we get into the chart that I gave you about last week about the different judges and the tribe they came from, and you'll see that on the map in the geographical location, but it will also, in some of those cases, be specific enough to tell you which particular ite that judge was trying to deliver his people from. So this is just my visualization of trying to understand all of these. They are connected. How deeply connected they are, I don't know, but I believe there's enough evidence to trace them back to Canaan or the Canaanites being the hub, if you please, the paternal father, if you please, of these other children who developed into nations. All right. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you one more screen here. Uh, 
Okay, come on. Okay. All right, can you see that? This is a chart that I gave you. And what I want you to try to note here, and I underlined them, and I suppose I should have made it a little bit bolder. Okay, here's the promised land. But notice, you got the Hittite Empire up here. You got the Sidonians. Now, though it's not listed, this is the Philistine area here. They were seaport people. And then you've got Moabites down here, and you got the Jebusites up here. You got the Hittites there. You got the Amorites. You got the Canaanites. So when you take a look at this second map that I gave you, here is how people have laid it out. Notice the Philistines over on the coastal area. The Canaanites evidently had a little bit of land here and a little bit of land over here. You got the Hittites down here, the Jebusites, the, the Hevites, the um, Hittites, the Hevites here. Um, and they were in two locations, it looks like, the Amorites and the Moabites. And so if you were to overlay this chart on top of this chart, if you had transparencies, you would get a pretty clear view of where the promised land and the tribes wound up in the Canaanite nations. I know it might seem a little bit complicated, but I think it's, it's valid for us to at least get a broad stroke understanding of the lay of the land as we begin to talk about these individual judges. And we will refer back to these maps, so please hang on to them as we do so. All right. Questions that you might have at this particular point. On this last map that you showed us on the Canaanite nations, uh -huh. now all of this land then is the promised land? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, any other any other thoughts? Hi Dr. Thomas, this is Carolyn. Hey Miss Daves. Hey, I like the information on the disobedience. Okay. Um I think that's a great way to explain that to counselees. Okay. Um the environmental part and all of that. So thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that. You are more than welcome. It's very important information as we talk uh, to people. And, you know, if you're going to be a people helper and they begin to share with you something that's going on, don't be afraid to ask questions, very simple questions like, when did you notice that this was beginning to happen? What was going on when this first began to happen? Uh, have you ever seen uh, this event happen in a, a family member's life? Now, you don't want to get into Spock right. and, and what have you, but preconditioning, I believe, is an unaddressed problem of exploration for those of us who are trying to help people. And if we I agree. Don't try to discover that. Then I think we are giving um, uh, limited 
uh, cosmetic surgery when maybe there needs to be major surgery that takes place? Thank you. I you agree. are more than welcome. Great question. Anybody else? All right. Well, I want to do two things, if it's okay with you. I want to give you the uh, new telephone number for uh, Bob Harvey, especially you uh, council members, okay? But the rest of you, you might want to take it down as well. Uh, Bob has been uh, holed up in his trailer. They have decided to leave him there until maybe the spring. His number, his new number is 570-928-2024. And I asked her about the telephone procedure because when I first got here, they told me to dial the number, let it ring once, hang up, and then call back again, kind of like his get smart secret code for answering the phone. And I asked him about that. Ask her about that. And she said, nope, I just let it ring until he gets it. So um, if you give him a call, just let it ring. Uh, he could be sleeping. Uh, I don't think he has a hearing problem like Carl Howell does. Next week when we get together, we are going to simply cover Judges chapter 2, 1 through 5. One through five. And we will branch off of that. I'll give you your study notes here uh, a little bit later on in the week. Tuesday, we pick up on providing genuine hope for the discouraged. And we're going to give you four reasons why you, <coughs> you can give hope. The average Christian can give solid, genuine hope. And I want to give you four reasons why that is possible. Thursday, we will do part two of Roman Catholicism. Uh, it will be at least a three-parter because now we're going to start talking about some of their, uh, their doctrine and beliefs and how they developed uh, with that. Now, I need to beg your indulgence with me. And I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>